I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Good morning, my name is Pastor Bob and I get to be, I get to be, I get to be one of the pastors here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church. Thanks again for the blessing of worshiping our Lord alongside you. It means everything. I'd like to introduce you once more to my mom, Edie. My mom could do a lot of things. She could snow and water ski. She could translate Latin. She could sail through just about any crossword puzzle and school just about anybody in trivial pursuit. And she raised four kids on her own. My mom could do a lot of things. But golly, my mom could not drive. I ain't lying. We lived on the corner of Maine and Woodland in Merrimack, Massachusetts. And when mom would pull out onto Maine and head down to the square, or square, as we like to say up there, she would have to take a left. Only she would get so psyched out by the fact that traffic would be coming her way as she rolled out of Woodland onto Maine, coming from both directions, that she would only edge out into traffic enough that she would cover all the southbound lane and half of the northbound lane. I suppose it didn't help matters that she drove a 1976 Pontiac Granville, roughly the size of your standard aircraft carrier. Anyway, though traffic would be several hundred yards away, Mom would suddenly see it as an imminent threat and would screech to a halt, choose not to move, and thus compel all other drivers to come to their own halt to the screeching variety. By this time, anyone bold enough to venture out with Mom was on the floorboard of the Granville, writhing in abject terror. Mom ventured out just enough to get herself and anyone with her darn near killed. God bless her. But when Mom had a choice to make, she chose to make no choice. I chose to get out of bed at 6.15 this morning. I chose to carry Max to the door to go out with him because he has an injured leg. I chose a workout after we came back in. I chose the setting on the coffee maker and the toaster. I chose what to wear. Half a dozen first choices of the roughly, if you believe an article in Psychology Today, 30,000 choices the average person will make in a day. Some will be fleeting and of little consequence. Some will change the course of history, my own or someone else's. Some will impact the next five minutes, some the next five years. Some will have a scope beyond earthly scope, choices. In his poem, The Road Not Taken, Robert Frost writes, two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. The protagonist in the piece makes a choice. In the passage we will read today, Jesus says to choose between the wide or the narrow gate, to choose whom we will listen and pay heed, to choose between on which foundation we will stand. Choices. Speaking of that passage, we again pick up where Christian concluded reading last week in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 13 through 29. Hear these words from the New Living Translation as Scott Bullard reads them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are in the last week of what has been a six-week worship series titled Mountaintop Experience, focusing on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as chronicled in the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of the book of Matthew. By way of recap, in week one, we talked about fellowship of Jesus as advanced citizenship, something we were going to have to want badly, for it would put up a fight in its promotion of life lived counterculturally and against the grain. In week two, we heard Jesus telling his disciples then and us now that he had come to the Mount of Beatitudes not to abolish the law that Moses had brought down from Mount Sinai, but in fact to fulfill it, bring it to realization as an inside job where we look in the mirror, examine our motives and our heart. In week three, we looked at the spiritual disciplines of fasting and praying and giving, of not if we engage them, but when, 
and of doing so not to gain, but, but to extend favor in Jesus' name. In week four, the subject was stuff and the danger that will be ours if we let it take up too much space in our lives, where it becomes our small G God and the big G God gets crowded out. Last week, we read of Jesus talking about our relationship to our brother and sister, to whom we have an obligation to offer kind treatment and not harsh judgment. Our relationship to a group, rather harshly, frankly, designated pigs, so base or animal in nature that we are told not to share the gospel with them. Once again, Jesus ain't here to make us comfortable. He will speak of our relationship with our Heavenly Father to whom we can come in prayer knowing that he delights in giving his kids good gifts. Finally, Jesus speaks of relationships to, well, everyone. He speaks of the golden rule, treating others as we wish to be treated, how it should be our default behavior. Finally, this week, Jesus will tell his listeners in first century Palestine and 21st century Pofftown and beyond that he had come to lay out the way of life, and it's time for us to choose. In the musical Fiddler on the Roof, the protagonist, Tevia, finds that his daughter has married Fiedka, a nice enough young lad who also happens to be outside the Jewish faith. And marrying outside the faith is a big deal. It's a line in the sand, a hill on which to die. Tevia cannot entertain the notion, but also laments the idea of disowning his daughter. We hear out loud of his eternal internal struggle. How can I accept them? Can I deny everything I believe in? On the other hand, can I deny my own daughter? On the other hand, how can I turn my back on my faith and my people? If I try to bend that far, I will break. On the other hand, no, there is no other hand. In his book, The Message of the Sermon on the Mount, Dr. John Stott writes that Jesus will allow us the torment that is Tevius. He will insist that there are two options, but only one choice. In the very first Psalm, we read of the contrast between the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Jesus will build upon this theme by speaking of narrow and wide gates, one difficult and one easy. My predecessor, Andy Lambert, posted last week in face, on Facebook about free speech, pointing out that in his many years of preaching at revivals, he had heard some cringeworthy things and some hilarious things and some things that were probably not of God, such of the maddening appendages of free speech, which he said allows for dumb stuff and mean and crap and dangerous ideas but it also paves the way for the hard and uncomfortable truths. And any attempt to dis diminish that is a foray into the really and truly dangerous. I'd suggest that the broader, easier path is to engage in what has come to be known as the cancel culture of silencing dissension. The narrow, more difficult path is to engage in the dialogue, to hear my brother and sister out, to reason together in the words of Isaiah. Am I willing to engage in that effort in a climate of get the last word in, ad hominem, gotcha exchange? Am I? At the risk of being personal, I wonder if you're getting enough sleep. Mine has been a crapshoot, frankly, frankly and, and a night when Max and I retire while Susan and Ross stay up with the Hallmark Channel that finds me granted uninterrupted snooze is rare indeed. And there is no one to blame but me. I brush my teeth, I kiss Susan goodnight, I turn down the sheets, I crawl beneath the covers, and I reach for the phone. I check Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, email, and after a day of bombardment of information, when my brain needs to shut down and rest, I choose to continue the sensory assault. Studies have shown that this is counterproductive to my pursuit of Z's in so many ways. Blue light hurts my eyes, my alertness kicks back into gear, compromising my alertness for the next day. There's a reduction in my REM or deep sleep. Put another way, I'm seeking the fruit of slumber while planting the seed of intensity. It hasn't ended well lately. Several years ago, I was serving on a walk to Emmaus and one of the participants or pilgrims was Rusty LaRue, a local boy who did pretty well for himself 
playing basketball, football, and baseball for Wake Forest before moving into a career in the NBA that saw him become a teammate of Michael Jordan. That's some cred. At a break in the proceedings of the walk weekend, a bunch of guys took to the basketball court, and Rusty was with them. And then he left them in the dust. It was clear that he was from another league, and the others stepped back and marveled, justifiably so. One was heard to say, that's how it's done, boys. That's how it's done. I hope you have someone in your walk in faith whom you look upon and say, that's how it's done. I think that's what Jesus was getting at when he spoke of the choice between the true and false prophets. I got to get to landing this plane. When I began today, I spoke of the Road Not Taken poem, which has a sidebar to it of which I was unaware before preparing this sermon. It seems Robert Frost had a friend and a fellow poet named Edward Thomas, who would, when walking with Frost, constantly lament not taking a different path. Frost liked to tease Thomas by saying, no matter which road you take, you'll always sigh and wish you had taken another. Another New England poet, John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, for all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Jesus is landing the plane on the Sermon on the Mount and he's asking us to choose. But I don't hear in his tone a measure of make up your mind. Instead, I think he's assuring us that the acronym FOMO, the fear of missing out, doesn't apply to his appeal. We need not fear missing out because he has covered it all. The poor who are kings, the sad who are tended to, the lowly who gain all, the empty who find bounty, mercy, purity, the wagers of peace, the ones at society's margins who are in fact society's most righteous, along with the lessons about salt and light, the law, anger, lust, divorce, vows, retaliation, loving our enemies, giving, prayer, fasting, money, worry, judgment, asking, seeking, knocking, ways to heaven, and building on the rock and sand, planting seeds. He has covered it all. Susan had a great way of summing it up when she said, if we keep on asking what if, are we crowding out the I am? I said a couple of weeks ago that Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But that's going to be a choice to be countercultural, to find meaning in what seems contrary, to live out the citation I alluded to when this worship series began. Choose this day too. Speak only the truth. Do not lust even in your hearts. Root out the rage from your emotions. Forgive without measure. Love your enemies. Wash your face when you fast so no one will know. Give without getting credit. Avoid being judgmental work for peace. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The time has come to choose. Are we ready? What are we going to do about it? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for its many blessings. Thank you for the chance to choose. Thank you for the leading of the way we should choose. Thank you for showing us the way, for being our Lord, for being our Redeemer, for being our Savior, for being everything. We have decided to follow you. I pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen.